you much. No, so exactly. unlike the morning sessions where everybody gave a talk, I'm going to do something a little bit different. I'm just going to give you like a quick three-minute overview of our speakers. Okay. Now, I think you've obviously it's been drummed into your head by Bobby Jasek this morning. You know, we're moving payment to quality and alternative payment models. Medicare has already said that they're a year ahead of where they want to be. Um, this morning's session was kind of interesting in what the agency said or didn't say. Um, from a collaboration from value-based group, I think you're hearing that collaboration, new models, um, not necessarily uh, a footprint model uh, as well, but collaboration and care coordination, collaboration and total cost management, shared accountability is critical. So we've got participants for the session. Uh, all of them are friends of mine. Uh, David Woods from Pentex Medical, Doug Levine from Shire, and Jason Karen from McDermott, Will, and Emory. And with that, um, I'm going to let them decide. They can either give a presentation or they can give a talk. It's up to you guys. What would you like to do? I'm happy to start off with a few comments and then... Okay. Perfect. Especially where you put the slides up already, so... Well, I could take I'll, it off. I'll, I'll, hit, I'll hit a few comments there and then... Uh, That'll be go. great. Yeah. Okay. So a, a very big thank you to, to Joel and the rest of the team here for inviting me to run across town this afternoon. Um, uh, as I was sort of looking at the topic and, and connecting with Jacob and, and Joel and thinking about, you know, how to bat this around with, with the other folks on the panel, um, there are a couple of, of concepts I thought. So why would you invite a lawyer to, to attend something like this? And I, I started from uh, from the clinical side of healthcare and then actually worked for um, for a, a trade group that was uh, arm wrestling with the society for a number of years and then had the indecision to work for the government for a bit. So I do a lot of payment policy work, um, and um, both within sort of the AMA processes, but also going up to, to Baltimore to see a lot of my f uh, former friends, and some of them are still current friends, and, and sort of some of the arm wrestling here. So as, as we were thinking about you know, this topical area, one of the sort of concepts I thought I'd throw out there was just really setting the, the policy stage for the alignment in the community that we're seeing occur um, and, and really thinking about that alignment as it relates to uh, what I call technology partners, industry, however you want to characterize it. And I think that alignment occurring in a way that uh, in the recent temperatures, uh, you know, all being under the cloak of conflict, wanting to sort of run through a few different concepts here and then uh, showing how, how um, our government actually uh, relies on industry as much as the rest of us. And so then I'll turn it over to the real experts, a couple of the other panelists here, and be happy to uh, participate in a discussion there. So um, on a disclosure basis, um, I've got the most conflicts in the room. Um, 1,100 lawyers in 13, 14 countries. We've probably represented everyone you know, on the spectrum. We do a lot of work for industry, health systems, medical societies, and the like. And so assume I have a conflict across the board. Um, in, terms of the, in terms of the backdrop, uh, you know, there's, there's this whole sort of concept around sunshine law. And one of the countervailing balances I've seen time and again is the, the fact that, well, well, you know, Senator Grassley and, and folks at CMS have struggled to actually embrace the fact that there is value in alignment and in partnership. You know, the, the, the quips that are out there are really sort of few and far uh, to find. And so I tried to highlight a few for folks as, as you're going through these discussions, and, and then we can get to some of the practical aspects of, I think, where it plays out. But I'll just sort of throw these out there. I think a lot of this is actually for people to, uh, to sort of have for notes as they're having conversations with policymakers, uh, with their own legal departments to say, wait, 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 time out. This is, you know, we can actually work together. There's, there's some limitations on what we can do, but we can actually work together. And I think a lot of folks quickly come to the conclusion that you cannot. And uh, for, for sometimes pragmatic reasons, they don't want to work together. And that's, it's, it's a, I've been the lawyer that's thrown in the middle sometimes to try to slow things down. And, and you know, that's part of it. But um, so, and actually, let me make sure I've got... As I go through these here. Uh, here, so this is actually an interesting dynamic. So we do a lot of work in Europe as well on the healthcare side of things. And as, it, as, as healthcare becomes much more global, and I heard the comments this morning about consumer-driven healthcare, you know, these concepts are actually, uh, they're, they're 
they're running across borders. And so I actually reached out to my, my partner in, in our Paris office who does a lot of work on, on the French equivalent of the Sunshine Act. And I asked for the analogs, all right? What, what are the French regulators saying to say, actually, where can you collaborate? And so it was interesting to see what she sent along here in terms of uh, how this is uh, playing out in Europe and the European markets as well. So here's, here's what I, I think um, one of the... One of the slides in, in a piece of information that a lot of people don't necessarily have access to or, or realize exists, but um, you know, the, the government is supposed to be transparent, and every once in a while it is. It probably takes about three hours to dig through the website to get to this actual document, but I, I, I provided a link here, and it's not the longest link I've seen, but it's a pretty long link, and it gives you a sense of who, who Health and Human Services, number one, uh, and, and on down, I think I've got, what, 30? They're top 30 contractors. So who does CMS, who does HHS across the board contract with it? Who are their partners in industry? And, and this is 2014 data. And you see some numbers, and, and right, so we have a lot of folks from what I'll call the life sciences community pretty early on. But, but number three, right, so General Dynamics Corporation, how many people in the room have ever done a, a data use agreement with CMS to actually get claims data? Raise just a show of hands. All right, so you, you strike the deal with CMS to get the claims data before they made it publicly available, and you could get this big data set, and you'd say, hey, I want to look at this. I, you know, I want to look at endoscopies, and these are the codes, and I want to look at this episode of care, and I want to look at, you know, three years post-care and what happened to the beneficiary. So you'd strike the deal with Medicare, and they'd make you sign this big contract of adhesion, and next thing you know, this guy from General Dynamics starts emailing you. Well, I'm actually the guy that pulls the data together and runs it, and... So do you want it this way? Do you want it that way? And then you'd end up having a separate conversation for a couple of weeks with General, General Dynamics because they have most of our data, which is very interesting. Um, so as you think about how things actually play out in healthcare and who are the who is involved, our government you know, is sort of a little bit hypocritical in the sense that they rely on major, major industry players to help them tackle their problems, just as much as we want to rely on industry players come together and sort of work and tackle these problems. Uh, if people want to have, you know, sidebar discussions about a number of these others that are on here, uh, of course, right, payers, you've got health systems, you've got uh, folks that are, again, you know, across the board, big consulting shops. Uh, I don't think they hire too many external lawyers, but uh, they have their big team, I think, over there that, that helps them on that side of things, so. So here's, here's I think, a couple concepts that I wanted to, to highlight in, in sort of aligning societies, industry, resources, um, and, and some things that I think. So right, industry has resources that benefit the entire healthcare community. And I think people you know, from the, the medical community sometimes really appreciate that and sometimes see it as, well, they're just looking to sell the next widget. So I think there are real resources that come to bear. And uh, I, I, I'd submit to you that uh, industry players that are not trying to solve the quality outcome issue don't last very long in any market. They're not going to last long in our market. They don't last very long in a market. And so we've all seen some folks present products, and it gets, it gets tough pretty quickly. Um, but they have resources that benefit the community. They can serve as advocates. They have strong voices, very strong voices here in Washington with CMS and the like. And so I think that's another attribute where you have some alignment. Um, they can bridge providers and payers in ways that a lot of people, you know, wouldn't expect. So I'm working with a relatively large U.S.-based medical device company, and there's a particular issue with a particular payer, and lo and behold, it's their exclusive TPA. Well, that, that, that commercial negotiation starts to evolve a little differently when you're talking about, you know, thousands and thousands of employees and switching TPAs as to, all right, you actually can pick up the phone and now stop starting to talk to my KOLs that actually think this is a good product for patients. Um, they have access to and can leverage data. So I think that attribute, right, uh, industry may have relationships with, and I'll, I'm going to sort of use them as a, as, as a dynamic and I personally think it's a great company, but it's also a client, right? General Dynamics, right? There's opportunities for industry to work with people like that, and they may have access to and, and will be able to leverage that data. And then uh, the last piece, and I was intentionally ambiguous on this point, um, because we have a real debate going on, is the alignment between, uh, alignment between industry and the medical society. So I'm working with one... Uh, APM now with one society where the whole model is to 
leverage physician services and um, and actually uh, create a real real downward pressure on certain prescription products, right? So the CVSs and Walgreens would feel the pain. The particular manufacturer of this product would, would feel the pain, but the physician service component would, would go way up. And so that's their APM proposal is I'm not going to take it out of my pocket. I'm actually going to put more in my pocket, but I'm going to get these guys. And so you, you see that attribute. Um, payers are actually loving it, right? So you're seeing these alignment opportunities there. Uh, where, whereas in other sectors, right, you see, and there's there's some folks that are clients and some folks that are uh, uh, just completely opposed to this concept, which is uh, industry participating in some type of risk related to an outcome, right? So big pharma debating now whether they're in, in big medical device companies debating whether they're actually going to take outcomes financial risk on the basis of their product. I'd submit to you on, one, on the one hand, you have people absolutely doing that, right? A market only pays for a product in, a, in a, an efficient market if it actually has value. And I know we, we can vigorously debate how our market's not an efficient market, but you know, that's one attribute of the spectrum. The other attribute of the spectrum is, well, let's, let's right, put, put some specific part of your payment at risk for an outcome that we can all talk about, whatever that endpoint is. Uh, and I'll leave it to the the smart people here to define what that is. But um, that, those are sort of my limited comments, and then uh, I'll turn it over, like I said, to the real experts here. Thank you. Thanks. Hi. Uh, my name is Doug Levine, and I was a gastroenterologist. Uh, for the last 20 years, I have not held a black tube in my hand, so I can't uh, uh, claim any sort of close allegiance to what, what you're feeling now as you're trying to take care of patients. The last 20 years I've been in industry at AstraZeneca, Ironwood, most recently at Shire. It's a pleasure, privilege to be invited to uh, participate. I'm going to be really quick. Um, the usual disclaimer from industry, the opinions expressed are not necessarily those of my management. I've got two slides, and um, I'm just going to ask that you look at them at leisure. Um, the first slide is really it's a list of constraints, and I think that if one thinks about today and what we're trying to do is a design challenge, you know, with any design excellence approach, you have to really define what it is that you want to shoot for. You need to understand the constraints, and then from that, you can generate the possibilities. So from an industry perspective, everybody in industry knows these things. I don't view these as 30-foot high walls that bar us from engaging, but it's stuff that we have to manage. So, you know, whether it's around, you know, regulations, trade codes, uh, companies' policies and procedures, they're there for a reason. There's also room for creativity. And for that reason, just want to outline that industry can support any number of ventures with societies, with practitioners, you know, based on the preceding constraints, but just understand what the channels are. So, you know, if there's a question, evidence that you're interested in, Industry may be able to help subsidize that. So, you know, whether that's through your participation as tri you know, as a trialist, hopefully as we're doing trials to help get that next widget approved by FDA, hopefully we're actually asking the right questions that are going to help in delivery of health care. Um, registries, observational research. Outside investigators can come to industry with proposals of uh, um, uh, data generation. Um, collaborative research are other avenues. We support educational grants. We provide sponsorships and charitable contributions, which probably allow for uh, a different level of creativity of activities that are of mutual interest. And I think the challenge in all this is really to find that sweet spot of strategy where there is overlap. And I think that there's a lot, of, there's a lot there. I think that everybody medically trained, whether you're in practice doing research or in industry, bottom line, you do want best possible outcomes and quality for patients. At the same time, I think all parties want either their product or their services appropriately reimbursed. So I think that there's a lot there that we share. I think that there's a lot there that we can work together on. The last piece that I just want to really emphasize is what the employee activities are. You know, everybody thinks about industry as either, you know, a funding source or whatnot. The other resource are the people that work within the companies. There are a lot of medically trained people very interested if there's opportunities for engagement on society committees, colloquia like this. You know, capitalizing on that uh, sort of intellectual uh, crosstalk is another opportunity to help move the dime. With that, I'll pass it on. Thank you. 
Doug. <clears throat> um, again, my name is David Woods, and I want to thank Joel for allowing me to, to take part today. I very much am enjoying the meeting and learning a lot. Um, just to give you a little background on me, I've been with Pentax for about 17 years. I was the president of Pentax Americas for 11 years. Um, I recently moved into a global role about a year ago. I'm the global uh, chief marketing officer for the company. My focus is product strategy. My focus is product development, uh, marketing, clinical affairs, and business development. Um, in my role prior, my goal in life was to try and understand exactly what our customers were trying to accomplish and cater what we did to help them get there. I was a big believer that if you help um, your customers develop their organization, not just one, one particular person in an organization, then long term you're going to help them grow. Um, to do that effectively, understanding that it's about quality, it's about efficiency, it's about cost, um, that nothing has changed in, in my current role. So now when it comes down to development of product, when it comes down to um, putting together an organizational strategy, if we don't understand how we're going to influence quality from, a, from a, um, a, a clinical relevance to a patient satisfaction to a patient safety issue, um, if we don't understand how our products are going to work in terms of efficiency, if we don't understand the cost and the, the real understanding that people can't spend more money on these products, they have to actually get better quality for the money that they're, that they're spending, they're not going to be successful. Um, so I think at the end of the day, that's the fundamental issue. Uh, for me, the only issue historically that has gotten in the way of that is some of the things that were talked about earlier. So transparency. Many times when you're brought in to, to work with a potential customer, there's not a lot of transparency about what's going on. It's more like what can you do versus what you can do. And when you actually bring significant value to your customers, you're sitting down and you're talking about what's working, what's not working, and I'm telling you how I can deliver a quality product, a quality service, and take cost out of my equation to, to be, able, be able to pass it on to you. But to do that, you have to have transparency, and you also have to have a mature organization to be able to do that effectively. Um, so not too long ago, a friend of mine went from a private practice environment to an academic setting where he was managing many different facilities. And I met with him and I said, um, if you have the ability to manage the process, I can take 20% out of what you're paying, I'm sure, and I can deliver at least the quality that you're get, getting today, and I bet you I can inc increase your efficiency. But my question to you, is your system mature enough to have that conversation? Because this is how I'll take cost out of the equation. And to be honest with you, together we actually provided savings to the system, but we didn't come anywhere near what the original target was to be. And it was because at the end of the day, the system really wasn't working like a system. They were a bunch of different sites delivering not even consistent standard of care in terms of, I think, how you would equate consistent standards of care, and not even segmenting the procedures being done to different sites of care. Um, basically just different cultures living within an, an, under, an, an umbrella of an integrated delivery network. Um, so transparency, maturity, and then sometimes not a commitment to competition gets in the way of some of these, some of these relationships. So many times what we're seeing now in healthcare is bigger is better, and the more we give one vendor, the more you know, we're going to get a little bit better price. But in reality, that doesn't increase competition, that doesn't increase innovation, that doesn't increase customer service. Um, so competition is huge, and we have to make sure that we protect that. So just in closing, um, I'm a very big believer that if I understand or our organization understands what our customers are trying to achieve, and there's really no difference between the United States, Europe, or other markets around the world, it's all about quality patient care, it's all about understanding the economics, and it's all about delivering that care as effectively as possible, then you can develop the right products by collaborating with your customers to deliver better clinical, clinically relevant products and help them use it as effectively as possible. So for me, it's really enjoyable to come to these conferences to really understand what everybody's going through and try to develop strategies to help you get to where you need to be. Thank you.